Welcome to Seven Crazy Digital Risks, the restaurant edition, and thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I do have three things to share with you. First is questions. You do have the ability to ask questions throughout the course. Just use the questions pane on your screen. We will take as many questions as we have time for, but remember we did promise to keep the session 30 minutes or less. Uh, second, we are recording today's session. And third, the, we will send the presentation and a link to the recording in a day or so. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers. First off, I am Chris Crawford. I lead the marketing efforts here at the Media Trust. And I will be joined by Tony Little, our product manager responsible for creating and delivering solutions for enterprise clients like fast casual dining restaurants. Now, when it comes to digital risk, it is a term that seems to mean different things to different individuals. For the purpose of this session, we will be honing in on risks specific to restaurant websites and mobile apps. And this distinction is really important when you look at the state of digital. It seems you know, really that a day can't go by without news of some website breach. We have a sampling of 10 significant breaches throughout 2020 that really are across the spectrum from a nonprofit in Australia to uh, the primo hoagies to government and even banks. And clearly this is becoming a growing problem or the problem just continues. The FBI recently released a report stating a 300% increase in cybercrime and so the question is, is what do all of these breaches have in common? They are client side breaches, which means code was injected and the problem is only seen on the user browser. And this is a very lucrative uh, attack vector. Very little effort yields big gain compared to a brick and mortar um, problem. Uh, one bad actor can find a vulnerability and hit multiple hundreds, maybe even thousands of targets at a time. And so this penetration of one restaurant website will likely affect millions of consumers um, or could potentially affect millions of consumers before it's identified and even shut down. And these attacks are so successful because restaurants and enterprises, they really don't own their websites and mobile apps. Uh, the, the composition of websites has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. The brochureware websites of yesterday were hard coded. The webmaster knew HTML and basic function was really to provide information. But today's websites have been designed to engage and to sell. So those static websites of yesterday have really given way to dynamic code to deliver personalized user experiences and promote the product. So, you know, in addition to uh, infrastructure related assets like content management, hosting, um, analytics that you would expect, there are thousands of other tools, actually like more than 7,000 at, at last count, were used they're, these are used to enable customized functionality for website visitors. So they help personalize and engage the user maybe with a content recommendation engine, ads, data management platform, payments. Um, for restaurants, you know, there's QR code generators to facilitate um, uh, in-store dining. There's been an increase in apps and loyalty and reward programs. And this example that we have is um, they've got restaurant, I mean, excuse me, they've got locations and you can even order supplies. But this code executes in the browser. It's not developed by the restaurant IT webmaster. It's sourced from a vendor or, um, or public library. Sometimes it's paid, a lot, oftentimes it's not. And so the end result is that 90% of the code that's executing and delivering this website and mobile app experience is from third parties. And the problem is the enterprise has no insight or control of the client side execution of this code and therefore is blind to security, data privacy, and performance issues. Now, 
I'm not saying that third party code is bad. It actually delivers the necessary functionality that consumers expect. But third party code really lies at the intersection of risk, revenue, and the user experience. So from a risk perspective, this code, it contributes to your digital tax surface. And it's anywhere you know, from three to five times higher than you would expect. You need to know the vendors that are executing. So like payment um, platform, are they bringing in fourth or fifth parties to help deliver their functionality? And this just then explodes your digital attack surface. And you need to know what their activity is um, so that you can be hip to when that activity is actually compromised. Now, from a revenue generating perspective, you know, your, your digital asset, it needs speed, ease of use, security to drive trust with your users. And these third party vendors, they're making calls and they're adding weight to the page and introducing latency. And from a user uh, experience perspective, this third party functionality while it's necessary, you need to be alert to when it is collecting uh, consumer data. And so the ability to manage this third party code is really the cornerstone for driving improvements in your risk posture. And so while there has been uh, a lot of attention paid to cybersecurity budgets and understanding third party risks, I'd argue it's, it's clearly not enough. And the money that is available isn't spent to actually secure websites and apps. And despite all the tools and tactics, your, your digital assets still are at risk. Now, in, in talking with our clients, we've been able to summarize the, um, the issues into five groups. First of all, there are scorecards. But scorecards are looking at owned and operated code. They don't normally account for the third party code and the fourth and the fifth party code that may be introduced into your digital environment. And then you have your consultants, you know, working with clients, you know, we repeatedly hear the consultants claim that there is no third party code on the asset. And that's just because they don't have the client side expertise to really assess what's truly executing in the um, the device in the browser, in the mobile app. And then third, there are the privacy and consent platforms. So like a CMP or a consent management platform, they're reliant on being provided accurate information. But in a digital world, you know, this information is changing constantly. So you need to be able to evaluate the content from both a consent and a non-consent perspective. And fourth, we have blocking of applications. So kind of like a content security platform, um, it's, it's a blunt instrument. Um, it's reliant on being provided a, a safe inclusion, allow list of what can actually execute. And we've repeatedly seen this this approach, breaking sites and ruining the user experience, which is a huge problem if you're looking to monetize. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's more than 7,000 different MarTech vendors. Um, do you know who all those vendors are? Just imagine the difficulty of knowing all types of domains that are necessary for um, rendering the user experience to thousands of different users. And then finally, we have third-party risk management platforms. Now, what these solutions are really doing is cataloging and managing interactions between the enterprise and external parties. But as we've seen in digital, most relationships aren't known, or if they are known, there's no contract or direct interaction with this uh, business partner. So while these solutions uh, cover certain aspects, there's still a significant amount of residual risk. And so to control your website and mobile apps, you really need to look at these key artifacts of digital risk. So we have looked at more than 100 uh, websites across eight consumer-oriented industries throughout 2020, and we measured them according to these three uh, key risk um, uh, or artifacts of digital risk. 
Now, the first one is understanding who has access to your customers. So who's executing on the site? So you would do that by reviewing all the executing domains every time a consumer is accessing um, the website or mobile app. These are the vendors that are executing, and this will include first party, third party, fourth, fifth party, anyone who's brought along to the party. Now, in our uh, analysis from 2020, and as expected, uh, media and retail are, are pretty high. They lead the pack. But these are strong, consumer-oriented sites that are continuously driving users to them. Media needs the eyeballs to view content because they're compensated through these ad views, and retail is, is pushing to sell their goods you know, direct to consumers. Restaurants, though, are pretty much in the middle of the pack here. What surprises me, though, is banking. You know, why do a, like a, a hundred different domains um, need to know what I'm doing when I access that banking site? The second question or thing you'd want to look at is understanding how volatile is your environment. Now, remember, digital is dynamic. It's constantly changing to deliver an optimized user experience. And you do this by measuring digital drift. You need to assess new domains. Um, we usually look at it on a monthly basis. You can do it uh, more frequently, but that becomes uh, pretty onerous. Now, again, from the 2020 data, media was high, averaging about 17%, um, but that's an ad-supported industry, so they need that for their monetization efforts. Restaurants are pretty much um, at the middle, maybe bottom of the pack, but they do appear to be fluctuating wildly. So they're averaging about 7%. Um, and this is probably likely driven by efforts to support and dr you know, drive online orders. But what's weird is uh, healthcare. It's, it's pretty high, uh, averaging about 12% uh, domain drift. So a hospital website where I'm sharing personal information, maybe making appointments or scheduling procedures or, or making payments, um, it should definitely be a lot more controlled than that. And then the third thing that you'd want to look at is um, the data exposure. So in this instance, we are looking at cookies, which we are gonna be using really for a simplified term for consumer tracking. Now, you've probably heard that uh, cookies are going away. That would be third-party cookies. But already throughout last year, we were, we were seeing new tracking technologies like local storage and fingerprinting. So from our perspective, you know, fingerprinting went from something we saw occasionally to something that we see regularly. Um, but cookies is what we were really looking at last year. We'll be changing that this year. Again, Media was pretty high and restaurants were in the middle, but banking, it looks like it's dropping an average of 220 cookies every time a user accesses the site. So who needs to know me and, and, what, and what are they doing with my data? So that's the overall kind of high level status of the ongoing or residual risk in digital environments across those eight consumer-oriented industries and the, the role third parties and the fourth and fifth parties that they bring, the role that they play in expanding the digital attack surface and negatively affecting the user experience. Now I'm going to hand this off to Tony to dive into digital risks that are specific to restaurant environment. Tony? Yep, sounds good. Thank you, Chris, and hello, everybody. Um, so what about Bobby? Uh, today we're going to walk through a digital scenario or journey uh, that mimics a real life situation and user behavior. Uh, one thing we do want you to keep in context here is that while this is a digital scenario with a lot of digital terms and digital language, uh, what we want you to think about is how would a, a human feel about these risks in a traditional brick and mortar setting. So the first thing that we want to drive, dive into here are the actual drivers of digital risk. Um, these are based on uh, a blog series that we did based on the seven crazy things that drive digital risk. Um, the first is security. And the key point that we want to drive home here is monitoring. Uh, that will be a theme throughout all of these digital risks. Um, 
But on the security front, you know, it's pretty easy to tell in a traditional brick and mortar setting if you have an imminent threat. Inherently, as people, we're, we're always on the lookout for this type of thing. So the concept is, of monitoring is as easy as telling your employees to keep an eye out. Um, with digital, it's a bit more complicated to tell when there's something malicious going on, like a domain bringing malware. There are no employees sitting in a store to keep an eye out. And this emphasizes the importance of digital monitoring to keep your consumers protected. Next thing we want to talk about is payment fraud. So if Bobby walked into a typical brick and mortar environment, would you want someone sitting at the cash register asking to take pictures of her credit card? Um, probably not. But within digital, skimming is actually a very common risk um, an attack that malicious actors will try um, that should be monitored for. So next we have slow response time. Um, this one I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. If you've ever waited for two hours in a restaurant to get your food, um, that type of experience can certainly be a little frustrating. Um, we see in speaking with our clients that consumers have similar feelings of frustrations when they wait an excessive amount of time for a page to load. So large amounts of third-party JavaScript and domains making network calls can slow a page down tremendously. Um, it's important to monitor and take action on these to keep your customer satisfaction high. Um, so customer hijacking, this is an interesting one to think about. Um, so imagine you're waiting in a line at your favorite grocery store and your cart's full of food and produce that you need. You're getting ready to pay for it all, but all of a sudden you're whisked away, teleported to a completely different store with a cashier you've never seen before, asking if you're ready to check out. Um, so this one's a, a little bit difficult to wrap your head around from a physical standpoint, but it's actually quite common in the world of digital. Luckily, it is preventable through the careful monitoring of these pages um, throughout your user journey. So data leakage. Um, we would expect that you wouldn't typically share your customer's loyalty members um, information with anyone that asks, um, but within the world of digital, the theft and leakage of this data is actually pretty common. Um, so monitoring and understanding who's on your site is a very important theme to keep in mind. Uh, similar to data leakage, we have data privacy. So you don't want just anyone having access to your consumer's data. Um, our clients express that they would want their customers feeling that their data is safe and secure. And the last one we have is regulatory compliance. So again, from our clients, we hear um, it's important to keep your consumers protected from a moral standpoint, but also more recently, there are laws and regulations around how these types of things should be handled. Um, with GDPR, CCPA, VCDPA, and other states following suit, it's important to get in front of this and be able to proactively say what steps are being taken to make sure your consumers are protected. Okay, so some actual digital risks. Um, we did an, an analysis of 10 restaurants throughout 2020. Um, and in that analysis, we found that 90% of domains um, are not owned by the restaurants and 2% of the domains that we saw are considered high risk. Um, so in looking at some specific sites, there are 98 domains on average. So within that, the greater the number of domains, um, the greater the amount of risk because of the variety of things those domains can bring, uh, like more calls, more latency, greater file download size, uh, and others. So if we focus on one or two examples in this first chart here, you can see a large variability in the yellow line versus the blue line. This could be a new program being rolled out, change in tag manager, a number of things, um, but it's just important to be aware of those things and that they're happening. So within the second chart here, we wanna take a look at digital rift, drift. Um, so there's 9% average drift um, which means there's a percentage of new domains each month. Um, large amounts of variation within the site signal lack of control. Again, looking at the yellow line, there's a significant amount of variability, which speaks to a pretty high level of risk in this example. And the last chart we wanna look at is cookies or data trackers. So uh, total counts provide some insight into the level of control the site has. And working with our clients, uh, really sophisticated security groups want to know what every cookie is and the purpose of it. So again, if we look at the yellow line, you can see a steep drop off in cookies and then a large spike. So this could be, again, any number of things happening, 
but it's important to have visibility and understand that it is happening so you can research and dive into trends. All right, so getting through the actual journey here. Um, if you think about a consumer's journey, there's four main steps and we'll walk through each one of those steps today. So step one, getting back to Bobby. Bobby visits the site and she wants to order some food, so she's looking around through the product pages. While doing that, there are 163 calls made by 34 domains, and only one of those is owned by the restaurant. 17 cookies are dropped, and only two of those are from the restaurant. So if we look at best in class, we say to strive for less than 50 domains. This example is pretty good there. However, with cookies, we say that 95% should be first party. Here, we're hovering around 12% first party. Okay, step two. So Bobby actually selects her food via the restaurant website um, and puts it in her cart. You'll notice an increase in calls and an increase in domains, as well as cookies. 36 domains, 21 cookies, and 19% of the cookies are first party. Step three, the actual payment. So Bobby inputs her payment information. Here we see no increase in domains, no increase in cookies. 27% uh, are now first party, which is a good increase. We would actually expect something like this because this is a very highly sensitive page and should certainly be the most secure in the user journey. Lastly, here we have the order confirmation. So Bobby receives her confirmation that her order is paid. Um, we would expect a bump here given the marketing need to track this information. Um, we have a slight bump up to 38 domains and also a bump up to 22 cookies from 15 on the previous slide. So analyzing the journey. Um, this type of digital journey speaks to the many potential risks that a consumer could face in digital that they would not necessarily face in the traditional brick and mortar setting. Um, we want to emphasize again here the payment page. So in working with our clients, we hear this is by far the most sensitive page, contains and exposes PII and PCI type data. Um, in this example here, we're high on domains, high on third parties, and our top clients uh, state that anyone outside of the first party and maybe a payment servicer should be on this page. Um, so there's a few questions to ask yourself. You know, Who are these vendors with access to your consumer data? How did they get to your website? What value do these vendors bring to the customer experience? And what is their total impact on security, privacy, and performance? In this example, we have a number of vendors like Quantum, Crux, Xander, and even TikTok on the payment pages. Um, definitely important to understand why they're there as well as who they are and the value that they bring. Okay, so our recommendation in taking some steps to control or mitigate your digital risk. Um, our clients typically ask us a lot, what should we tackle first? You know, we recommend to pay attention to the payment page, obviously. This is the information that bad actors want. Um, so what steps would you take um, in taking that initial step to go tackle the payment page? Um, we recommend you take 30 days, assemble a, a tiger team of people you need, usually cross department, and document your needs. Over the next three months, um, you should spend some time actually auditing that environment. Have an example of a policy, a physical contract that should reside with your digital risk teams and communicate out expectations internally and externally. There's a number of uh, regulations involved like CCPA, um, state of Virginia opt-out rules, so you should know when someone is violating. After the audit, um, you would enforce your policies. So several of our clients leverage our partnerships with third parties to remediate and resolve any policy violations that they might have. Uh, definitely give your third parties the opportunity to correct their errors. But if worst comes to worst, um, you know, you could apply legal weight or take any necessarily development action to remove unwanted third parties from your site. And this concludes our overview of the state of digital risks in retail environments, especially fast and fast casual. To learn more, I encourage you to visit our industry insights. Just visit our homepage at mediatrust.com and click on the industry insights button in the upper navigation. 
you'll see a collection of industry specific benchmarks that are updated on a monthly basis. And if you have any additional questions, go ahead and reach out to us at info at themediatrust.com. Thank you.